Hey folks, uh, this is going to be a review lecture for test number three. This is spring of 2022. And what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to cover the topics that are going to be on your test number two and just review um, some of those topics with you. Obviously, you can go back and rewatch all of the individual videos. So if something that I mentioned today in passing is not something that makes a lot of sense to you, then you're welcome to go back and take a look at the video and rewatch that material until it does make sense to you. There's usually lots of examples in the videos. So just taking a look at the schedule here, I want to review what's actually covered on the test. So test number three began with conditionals, and then it continued into repetition, and then it finished up with 1D arrays. We did conditionals for one week, repetition for two weeks, and 1D arrays for two weeks. The repetition was the for loops, the while loops, the do while loops. The 1D arrays were the arrays of characters, numbers, and whatever, um, and also the for each loop and some of the other stuff that we looked at. So we're going to start off with the um, conditionals, and then I'm going to move on from there. So the types of questions that you're likely to get on conditionals, you certainly should be able to write an if statement. So for example, if we have um, x that is an integer, so we might have int x equals 7, and I might also have a, another integer, let's call it y, int y equals 5, then I could check to see if one of those is true, if both of those are true, if anything like that. And so that's where we're going to use an if statement. So I might say if x is greater than 5 and y is greater than 5, then we would print out a, let's say. All right, and then another part of this question might be else if x is greater than 1, and y is less than 10, system.out.println b. All right, so an example question might be something like this. What will this code print? Well, you'd have to look at each of the variables and decide, based on the variables that you were given, which thing is true and which thing is not. So remember that with an if statement, what's in the parentheses has to be evaluated. And in this case, what's inside the parentheses includes an and, so the way that an AND works is both sides must be true in order for the statement to evaluate to true. So we're going to take the first part of this, x greater than 5. So 7 is greater than 5. So it turns out that that is true. All right, now we're going to look at the other part, which is y is greater than 5. Well, y is 5, so 5 greater than 5 is false, because 5 is equal to 5, They're not great. it's not greater than 5. So we're left with true and false. And with an and operator, true and false is going to be false. Remember that with and, both sides have to be true in order for you to get true. In all other conditions, it's false. With or, if either side is true, then or both are true, then you get true. Otherwise, you get false. So with or, you're going to get false only if both sides are false. In every other condition, you get true. With and, both sides have to be true. In all other conditions, you get false. And then the other one was not, um, which is to negate something. So if you start it with true, not makes it false. Okay, so there were lots of things that you could deal with here. It looks like this first statement evaluated to false. So with an, el an if, else if, the way that that works is it checked this condition, it was false, so it's going to move down and check the next condition, which is this else if. So x greater than 1, 7 is greater than 1, that's true. Um, y less than 10, y is 5, so 5 less than 10 is true. True and true is going to be true. So the way that a if statement works is if the part in the parentheses is true, we do that. If it's not, we move on and we check the next condition. But since this one was true, this is going to print out B. And so if I were to hit the uh, run button here, in a moment you're going to see that that's going to print out B, not print out A, because only the second condition was true. So remember that in an if else if statement, even if both of these had turned out to be true, only one of them will ever happen. So if I change this to x greater than 5, 7 is greater than 5, and y greater than 1, y is greater than 1, it's only going to print out A. Even though both of those conditions are true, meaning the if statement and the else if statement will both evaluate to true in the current situation, this will only ever print the A, because in an if-else if, 
only one of the statements will ever execute. Once one is true and executes, the whole if statement is now complete and it will not move on and check the other ones. By comparison, if I broke this up to not be an if else if, and instead it was just an if followed by another if, then I would actually get both the A and the B in this circumstance. Because in this case, there are two independent if statements. So the first one evaluates, it's true, it prints its A. The second one evaluates, it's also true, so it prints its B, and I will see both of them. So this is the difference between two independent if statements and an if else if statement. An else if statement is combined as a single statement, and only one of them will execute, whereas an two if statements could independently both print out their values. The final thing that we should talk about with if statements is that you can also have an else condition. And in the case of an else condition, that will happen only if neither of the above ones actually happened. And so if I add in C here, and this is back to an if else if, I'm still going to get A because the first condition is true. And that is good enough. It just prints A and then it stops. So if I change this so that that is no longer true, so X greater than five is true, but Y greater than 10 is not true, it'll move on and it will run the second if statement. And in this case, X greater than one, which is going to be true, Y less than 10 is going to be true, so it's going to print B. But if I change this to Y less than one and I run it again, now I'm going to get C because the first if condition is false, the else if condition is false, and so we get the else condition and it's going to print C for me. All right, so that's how an if condition or a conditional works. If statements are always going to have those parentheses after the if, and they're always going to have a set of curly braces that hang out afterwards. So this syntax as written on the screen is always going to be here. These parentheses are non-negotiable. They must be there. And then after the if statement, you're always going to have these curly braces with the code that you want to run inside of the curly braces. There can be more than one statement in here. You could have two, three, four, five, six, seven statements. Doesn't matter. You can even have nested if statements as we saw as well. The details of the conditional, the thing that is actually being checked, is this must evaluate to a Boolean. That is non-negotiable. And so that means it pretty much has to be either a relational or logical um, evaluation. So relational ob evaluations or relational operators, those were greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, equal to, not equal, and you also had dot equals for strings. All right, those were all the relational operators. And then the logical operators were the and signs, which is two ampersands, the or sign, which is two pipes, and the exclamation sign, which was the not. So it's gonna be a combination of relational operators, and or logical operators that are put together to make up one big if statement that is in parentheses there. And then again, you can have just a standalone if that is completely valid. There doesn't have to always be an else if, but if you're going to have else ifs, you can have as many else ifs as you want. So the way to phrase that is you can have zero or more else ifs. And then at the op bottom, you can have an optional else and there can only be one else. So if you're going to have an else, there can only be one of those. If you have a single statement where it's an if, else, if, else, only one of those things can ever operate. If they are all independent statements, then they could each independently happen. So if it's an if, an if, and an if, you can absolutely have all three of them happen. If it is an if, else, if, else, if, else, only one of those things will ever happen. So that's the short version of conditionals. We certainly did lots of examples with them in class, um, but hopefully that will help you remember how conditionals work. So the next thing we're going to move on to is loops. All right, so as far as loops are concerned, you will remember that we covered three different kinds of loops. Um, we discovered that there was a while loop, we discovered that there was a do while loop, and we discovered that there was a uh, for loop. We later mentioned a for each loop, but we're gonna deal with the first three again, um, just to remind you how they work. So in each of these cases, you're going to have some kind of condition that you are checking, a Boolean, much like an if statement. And while that Boolean is true, the loop is going to keep running. Whenever the Boolean becomes false, the loop is going to stop. So we'll start off with a while statement. And so you might have while, and let's say x is greater than one. Let's actually do while x is less than 10. 
So what is this x, you ask? Well, we have to define it. So we're going to say int x is equal to 0. And then inside the loop, I'm just going to print out x. And then I'm going to say x plus plus, which means that each time through the loop, the x is going to get one larger. And so what this is going to print out for me is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. It will not print out 10 because x less than 10, 9 is less than 10, but 10 is not less than 10. So it will never print out the 10 for me. So I got 0 through 9. All right, so there are three parts to this loop. This part we call the initialization. This is the test, the thing that we are testing, and this is the increment. And in the case of this, we're initializing x to 0. While the x remains less than 10, the loop is going to keep running, and I'm changing x by 1 each time through the loop. If I were to omit this statement, that is changing x by 1, and I just commented out so it's not happening, what I'm going to produce is an infinite loop that's always going to print 0. And so you're going to see in a moment, it's just going to start spewing out zeros, and it's going to keep doing that forever and ever and ever. And this is because during the loop, nothing is ever changing x. So it starts the loop, it says, is x less than 0? Sorry, is x less than 10? Yes, 0 is less than 10, so print 0. And then it comes back to the top and says, is 0 less than 10? Yes, it is, so it prints 0. Is 0 less than 10? Yes, it is, it prints 0. So without this thing that's changing the x, the loop is always just going to print the same thing over and over again. And so that's not desirable. That's called an infinite loop, and it's something we definitely want to avoid. All right, so we can have it do it as often as we want. If I change that to 100, it's now going to print from 0 to 99. And that's great. That's going to give me a whole bunch of output um, without a whole lot of code. So you can see in there, it starts at 0, and it goes all the way down to 99. So you can see I got lots of output there. All right, if I wanted it to move by 5, I could say plus equal 5. This doesn't always have to be a plus plus. And so when I run that, I'm going to get 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, all the way up to 95, and then it's going to stop. And that's because, again, checks to see if the current value of x is less than 0, which it is, 0 is less than, sorry, the current value of x is less than 100, 0 is less than 100, therefore it prints 0, adds 5 to it, x is now 5, 5 is less than 100, prints 5, 10 is less than 100, prints 10, 15 is less than 100, all the way up until 90, 95 is less than 100, and then 100 is not less than 100, so the loop ends. Remember, if there's anything after the loop, that will happen after the loop. It's not like the program completely ends, it's just that the loop will end. So at the end of this statement, it's going to print out, we are done one time after the loop is over. And that's because I put that outside of the curly braces for the loop. Remember, if you click on something in um, your IDE, it will tell you where the closing curly brace is. And you can see that the opening and closing of this is from here to here. This is outside that loop. If I were to pick that up and put it inside the loop, it would print every single time. So the difference between what's currently there and what's about to be there is how many times that gets printed. So now it's going to print every time. So we're going to get 0, we are done, 5, we are done, 10, we are done, 15, we are done, and so on and so forth, which is obviously not what we want, but that is what it's going to print. Okay, so that's a while loop, and this is just counting with a while loop. You could absolutely convert this while loop into a for loop, because it turns out a while loop and a for loop are usually very well related. So to convert this to a for loop, we just change the syntax for int and I'll call it y just so it's not x, equals 0, y less than 100, y plus plus, uh, plus equals 5. And again, in here, system.out.println, this time I'm printing out y. All right, so I'm going to comment out this first block of code. So I'm just going to do the slash star and the star slash thing. That comments all that out so the compiler will ignore it. This will work exactly the same as the code above. The only thing that's different is I'm using a for loop instead of using a while loop. And so we're starting off at 0, it's going to print 5, then 10, then 15. Effectively, the parts of this are equivalent, and so all I've really done is this part right here is the same as this part right here. And likewise, this part right here is the same as this part right here. And finally, this part right here is the same as this part right here. The initialization, the test, and the increment 
are just moved to different places, but the syntax otherwise is the same. So that's the difference between a while loop and a for loop. They are always interchangeable. You can always convert one to the other, but the for loop is just a little bit cleaner. Remember that there's semicolons in between each of the items when you do a for loop um, that is necessary in order for it to work. Okay, so that is the different kinds of uh, for uh, whiles and fors. The last type of loop that we looked at is a do while loop. All right, so a do while loop works very similarly to a while loop. You say do, and then at the bottom is where you have the while. And so we could do pretty much the same exact loop here while x is less than 100. Remember, you need that semicolon at the end. And we could start off by doing an initialization outside. So int. I guess z in this case, z is equal to zero, z less than 100. And then we would print out z, and z will have to be plus equal to five in order to get the same output. So this loop is going to do pretty much the same thing that the other loops did. Um, the only thing that's really different is when it checks the condition. So in the first loop and in the for loop, it checks the condition at the top of the loop. In this one, it checks it at the bottom of the loop. And realistically, that doesn't make any difference to the output in the way that I wrote this. But in some circumstances, this is going to be useful where you're going to want to check something at the end of a loop, not at the beginning of the loop. And so one example of this, and probably the most common example of why you would use a do loop, is you might want to check user input. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to import Java Util Scanner because we're going to need to read in something. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a scanner. And then that's missing an S. There we go. And then down at the bottom, I'm going to write another do loop. And this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the user to enter in a number between 0 and 100. So system.out.println give me a number between 0 and 100. All right. So what I want to do is I want to validate that the user has actually done what I told them to do. I want to make sure that they gave me a number between 0 and 100. I'm just, again, going to comment all these out so that this is the only code that's running to remove confusion. So anytime I have a do, I must have a while. And what I want the while to check is that they gave me a number between 0 and 100. So if they didn't, I'm going to ask it to keep asking them over and over. So first off, let me read in their answer. So I'm going to make a variable called answer which is an integer, and I'm going to just create it outside of the loop. Inside the loop, I'm going to say answer is equal to my scan dot next int. That's how I read in a number from the user. All right, so in my while loop, I'm going to say while the answer is less than zero or the answer is greater than 100. Okay, now this is a little bit backwards, so let's think about this for a moment. I need them to give me a number between zero and 100. So zero is a valid answer. 1 is a valid answer, 15 is a valid answer, 99 is a valid answer, 100 is a valid answer, but anything outside of those range is wrong. So if they give me negative 1, I want to re-ask them the question. So effectively, I want this loop to keep running as long as they're giving me answers that are less than 0 or answers, or answers that are greater than 100. So if we run this code, um, it's going to ask me to enter in a number. And I forgot my semicolon because I always forget my semicolon. It's going to ask me to enter in a number between 0 and 100. And I'm going to be a typical user and I'm going to give it completely valid, invalid numbers. So negative 2. It says, give me a number between 0 and 100. I'm going to say 105. It says, give me a number between 0 and 100. I'm going to say 95 and the loop stops. So it continued asking over and over again until they gave me a number that was valid. So I basically told the loop to keep running while the answer is invalid. All right, so that's the most common use of a do loop. It's usually a do loop because you want to ask the question at least once. If you had done a while loop, you'd have to initialize answer to something invalid to make it even go in the first time because a while loop can absolutely never happen. And so my example of that is I could write a while loop that says int w equals 5 while w is less than 5, system.out.println high. So how many times is that going to print high? The answer is 0, because w is equal to 5, and the while condition is checked right at the very beginning. 
five is not less than five, so it's never going to print high. That code in there is actually never going to happen. And so even when I type in 95, you can see I don't ever get the high from down there. Um, so it's possible to write a while loop or even a for loop that has this problem. So for int v equals five, v less than five, v plus plus, this also will never happen. And again, I'm never going to get hello because the condition is wrong. With a for loop, the initialization is done and immediately the test is checked. And if the test fails, the loop is never going to run. So this is gonna ask me for the number between zero and 100. It's gonna read in that answer. I'm going to type in 95 the first time so that it's good up there. And then the program ends, neither of the bottom two loops is ever going to execute because of the way that I wrote them. So make sure that you're keeping track of the fact that your initialization and your test condition must match um, in a way that makes sense. All right, so we're going to do two more things with loops, and those were the, con the break statement and the continue statement. So I'm going to comment all of this stuff out again. I'm leaving all these in the replit just so that you guys can go back and take a look at it if you want to. The URL is up at the top of the screen. Um, so you can just fork it, and then you can uh, play with any of these that you want to. But the next thing I'm going to write is um, I'll do a for loop. So for int i equals 0, i less than 100, i plus plus. And then I'm going to say if i is equal to 5, break. Okay, now this is a really weird way to write a loop, but it definitely works. What a break statement does is if that is ever called, if you ever call break, the loop stops immediately. So normally this loop would have printed out 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to 99. But in this case, because I am checking to see if i is equal to 5, and I'm breaking at that point, I am going to only print out 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Oh, well, actually, I never did a print statement. So I was like, why is this not working? Sorry, meant to print the i. So it's going to print 0, then it's going to print 1, then it's going to print 2, then it's going to print 3, then it's going to print 4, then it's going to print 5, and then the break statement is going to stop it. If I comment out this break statement down here, you'll notice that the loop will continue all the way out to 100. So what break does is it immediately stops the current loop. So a break statement, when it happens, immediately stops the loop. So there are two different ways this loop could stop. The first way is if i reaches 100. At that point, the outer for loop will stop it. The other way is when i equals 5, it will stop it. And so a common example that we tend to do with this is you might want to print out only the even numbers in an array. So you might say for int i equals 0, i less than 100, i plus plus. And then you might say something like if i mod 2 is equal to 0. Remember this mod operator? If you mod something by 2 and it evenly is divisible by 2, then you know it's an even number. System.out.println i. All right, and so I have... I'm going to just comment the previous one out again. Oop. Yikes. Okay. Trying to comment. There we go. All right. So when I run this guy, what it's going to do is it's only going to print out the even numbers this time. So it's going to print out 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. And that would have been true if I had actually printed the variable i rather than the string i. When I printed the string i, well, it turns out it gave me i because that's what I told it to give me. Um, so now I'm going to get 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and I only get the even numbers. And so you could have it so that the first time it finds an even number, it breaks. And so if I break in here, what we're going to see is 0, and then it is going to stop. Because uh, that is being strange. Let's run it again here after we've cleared the screen. We got 0. 0 mod 2 is indeed 0, and so therefore we broke, which stopped the loop. All right, so that's a good example of a break statement. A continue statement is kind of similar to a break statement, but it does something slightly different. A continue statement is going to restart the current loop. And so, for example, we might say for int i equals 0, i less than 100, i++. plus plus. All right, and so I'm going to say 
system.out.println, and we're gonna print out the i variable again. All right, so that would print out zero to 99. We've seen that a bunch of times. But what I'm going to do is right before that, I'm going to say if i is equal to five, continue. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna lower it so that it only prints out to 10, just so that it's a little bit visible. So without these statements in here, it would have printed 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. But with that statement, it's actually going to print 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9. You'll notice that the 5 didn't print. And what the reason for that is because when i was equal to 0, this if statement was false, so it just printed. When it was 1, the if statement was false. When it was 2, when it was 3, when it was 4. So in all those cases, it just printed as normal. But when we got to i being equal to 5, the if statement was true, so it called continue. And as soon as it called continue, the loop just restarted on the next iteration, which changed i to 6, and it never got to the print statement. So everything down below the continue inside the loop is just skipped, and we go back to the top of the loop and move on to the next statement. So that is loops. We have while loops, do while loops, and for loops. In all cases, they're going to have an initialization, they're going to have a test condition, and they're going to have something that increments. And so you're going to be asked questions about tracing for loops, about going through a for loop and seeing um, what it's going to print out, seeing if it ever prints anything, seeing if it's an infinite loop, or which statement would you need to add into a for loop to make it print by five or make it print by 10 or only print out the evens or the odds or stuff like that. So I've done examples that are pretty similar to the types of questions you're gonna get asked. You definitely need to know the continue word and the break word, and you definitely need to know like an I plus five, I'm sorry, I plus equals five versus an I plus plus versus greater thans, less thans, greater than or equal to's, the ands and the ors from the previous ones as well. So that's going to be the loop section. And then the final part is with regards to arrays. And so in arrays, we had a bunch of different things that we talked about in there. So I'm just going to start a new replet um, to talk about arrays. So an array is just a collection of data that's put together in a single variable. There are a couple of attributes about arrays that are non-negotiable, which is that the size of the array must be set at the very beginning. And the technical term for that is arrays are static. The size of them cannot change. They are not dynamic, they are static. So once you say it's an array of size five, it is an array of size five. You cannot put something in the sixth cell. There's no way to grow the array. It is just five because that's what you said. The other rule is that arrays are homogeneous. What that means is that they contain only the same type of data. So when you define an array, you specify the type. So you might say int and then square brackets. You give it a name, uh, my array, and then you say equals new int, and then in the square brackets, you tell it how big it is. So my array is a variable. It is homogeneous, meaning that it can only hold integers. I cannot put floats in here. I cannot put cars or strings in there. I can only hold integers. It is static, meaning that there will be five cells. It is not changeable. All right, and then if I want to put things into the array, I would say my array at index zero is equal to the number seven. Okay, so let's talk about this. This is called the index to the array. It is the name of the a number that speaks about the individual cells in the array. This is the value that I'm putting into the array. Um, so you can call this the element that I'm putting in the array. This is uh, seven is being put into cell zero. So static because size, um, homogeneous because it can only hold integers. This is called an index. So my array at index zero, my array at index one, my array at index two, each one of those is called a cell and each cell has a value in it, um, which is sometimes called the element that you're putting in there. Okay, so that's how you create an array. There are actually a couple of different syntaxes for creating an array. They don't always have to be integers. So you could also say int my array two is equal to new int and then in this case, you don't put a number inside the curly brace inside the square brackets, but you do put a set of curly braces after it, and you put whatever values you wanted to initialize the array with. So this is going to create an array that will have two in cell zero, four in index one, six in index two, 
8 in index 3, 10 in index 4, and 12 in index 5. There are six cells in this array. They are index 0 through 5. All right, and so this puts values into the array. It is possible for me to change a value in an array. So if I say my array at my array 2 at position 3 is now equal to 5, then this one didn't change because that's cell 0. This is index 1, index 2, index 3. That's the one that changed. So at the end of statement line 7, I would have an array that contains 2, 4, 6, 5, 10, 12, because each cell can only hold one value at a time. And if you put a new value into the cell, the old value is taken out of the cell. All right. As I mentioned, arrays don't always have to be of integers. You can have an array of characters. My cars is equal to new car. And inside of there, I can put an A, a B, and a C. Or I can initialize it the other way and then set the individual values. There is actually a shortcut that I should mention here. Float my floats. Um, you can just say equals 7.2, 3.5, and 9.1. And I'm pointing this out because if you're doing the initialization, it actually allows you to not specify equals new. You can actually just omit that. Um, we never really talked about that in class, but I just wanted you to see that that is a valid syntax as well. All right, so arrays can be of integers, they can be of floats, they can be of doubles, of shorts, of longs, of bytes, they can be of cars, they can be of booleans, they can be of strings. If it's gonna be an array of strings, it works the same way. This will give me an array that can hold three strings, and I might put a value into the first one. My strings at position zero is equal to enda, and that is perfectly valid, and I can do that. So arrays can be of any of the different types. They can be initialized or not initialized. That's two different syntaxes for doing that. When you want to access a cell, you just give the name of the array followed by the index number in square brackets, and then that can either be printed or you can assign to it depending on what it is that you want it to do. All right, the next thing that we talked about is that there is a length variable. So you can say int my strings length is equal to my strings dot length. And what that will do is it will tell you how many cells are in there. Now we happen to know that the answer is three because we defined that one as three, but you could imagine that that would be useful um, if you were trying to do something. It's especially useful for if you wanted to do a print, uh, print of all of the individual items. So you could say int i equals zero, i less than my strings dot length, i plus plus, and then print my strings at position i, and that's going to print out all the values that are in there. And so right now it's going to print enda and then two nulls because, well, I never put anything into cell one or cell two. They're both currently empty. Um, possible lossy conversion. Okay, all of these needed an F. When you're defining something as a float, you need to tell them that they're floats. Um, that's what that's complaining about. And this should print enda and then null null because there's nothing in the other two cells. There it is. And I also have a hello world because that's hanging out down the bottom apparently. All right, so that sets values. We also talked about a for each loop. So the same way to do that um, with a for each loop would be for string x colon my strings print x. And this will automatically take care of the size of the array. And so now this is going to print end and null null from the first for loop and then it's going to print end and null null again, this time from the for each loop. The only difference between the for loop and the for each loop is that a for each loop can only go over arrays and array lists later when you get there, and they automatically know how big the array is, they automatically do the incrementing, they automatically know how to do the individual um, movements through the array. They know how to iterate through an array. All right, the last couple of things that we talked about with arrays where we looked at how to calculate a sum of values in an array, we looked at how to calculate the min and the max inside of an array. And so let's talk about those very briefly. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna comment out all of this just so that I don't have 52 different arrays that are hanging around here. And I'm going to make a new array down here. So to create an array of integers, it's gonna be int square brackets. You can call it whatever. 
I'll call it Bob, is equal to new int square brackets, and then I'm going to initialize it with some values. So 4, 19, oops, 80, 82, 91, 5, and 1. Okay, so if I wanted to find the sum of all of those values in the array, what I would need to say is something like for each, or for, we can do it either way, I'll do it with a for loop, for int i equals 0, i less than bob dot length, i plus plus, and then I need to add each value to a sum variable. So I'm going to make a sum variable to start with, int sum equals 0, and as I go through the loop, I'm going to say sum plus equals bob at position i. So that's going to take bob at position 0, it's going to add it to sum, then bob at position 1, then bob at position 2, bob at position 3, bob at position 4, bob at position 5, and that's going to give me the sum. So at the end of all of this, if I were to print out the sum, I would end up with whatever that all adds up to. Um, and I don't actually know off the top of my head what that adds up to. It's probably somewhere in the high 200s. So let's see what we get. 202. Well, when I said high 200s. Yeah, close. Um, all right, so that is how you would do a sum. If you were doing an average, the only thing you got to do is you got to divide it by the number of entries in the array. So float average is equal to sum divided by bob.length. And I could certainly print that out. Anyone want to take a guess as to what the average is going to be on those? I'm guessing it's going to be somewhere in the 30s. So 30 something, it's two that are pretty high and two that are pretty low. So maybe 30 or 40s, 33. Yes, I got something right. Okay, so that calculates a sum, it calculates an average. If you were looking for the min or the max, usually what you do is you either assume that cell zero is the min or the max. So let's do min. So I'm gonna say int min is equal to Bob at position zero. And then as you're going through the array, you're simply going to check if bob at position i is less than min, then you're going to change min. Min equals bob at position i. At the end of the loop, you now know what the min is. And so that should tell me that the min is 1, hopefully. And so again, that works because I assumed that 4 is the smallest. And then as I went through the loop, I checked, is 19 less than 4? No, it's not. Is 82 less than 4? No, it's not. Is 91? No. Is 5? No. Is 1? Yes. So when 1 was less than 5, it changed the min to 1. And now we know that the min is 1. So this is absolutely how you would do a min. The max works pretty much the same way. You would just pretty much change that, and you probably should rename your variable to max instead of min, but it'll work the same way, and there's an example of that in the video on arrays. So the types of questions you're going to get on arrays, we're going to give you lots of tracing ones where we give you code that looks like this, and you're going to have to trace through it and see what's going on. You do have access to a piece of paper, so remember, the right answer is to draw out the array on your piece of paper, and then figure out what's happening as you're going through it. Don't just try to do it in your head, actually draw it. So the correct way to draw this array would be something like this. There's a four in that cell, there's a 19, there's an 82, there's a 91, five, and one. Label each of the cells. Remember that it's zero, one, two, three, four, and five in this case. So that's how you draw that out. And then you go through your code and it sets i is equal to zero, and then i less than 6, um, i++. Plus plus. And then as you go through it, your sum plus equals bob at position i. Well, i is currently 0, so the sum at position 0, or the uh, array at position 0 is going to be 4, so your sum started off as 0, and now it's equal to 4. When your i++ plus plus happens, the i is now equal to 1, and so sum plus equals whatever is in 1, is going to add 19 to it, and the sum is now equal to 23. The i becomes 2, and when the i is 2, it's going to try and add 82 to 23, and that's going to give you 105 or whatever that is, and so on, and so on, and so on.
trace it out with your piece of paper the way that I'm doing it here, and you will always get the right answer. Do not just look at the code and assume that it's always the same. So to be clear, we absolutely can and probably will give you code where it is not always the case that I starts off as zero. So be sure that you actually read what it says here and be sure that you actually read what it says here and be sure that you understand what it's checking in there. So if this is an I plus equal five, you're moving by fives. If it's an I minus minus, you're going down by one each time. So don't just assume you're always going up by one. You sometimes will, you sometimes won't. And then trace through whatever's happening inside the code and you'll get the right answer. So again, to review, in, this, in the questions on the test, you're going to get asked, take a look at this code, trace through it, make sure you understand what's going on in here, and then give us what the output would be of the code. And there's going to be lots of those types of questions. All right, so that tells you the types of questions that you're going to have in the final exam. The last remaining things to know, the exam is scheduled for right here, um, mon midnight through midnight on Monday, May 9th. So do not forget that your test is on Monday the 9th of May. That's not this coming Monday, it's next Monday. And it is going to be from midnight to midnight. So you can take the test anytime during that window. Um, the official scheduled time for your test according to KSU is sometime in the middle of the day. So you cannot have a conflict with that entire day because one hour or uh, two hours are actually blocked out during the day for that exam. Um, make sure you take the test. If you miss the test, there are no makeups, so there is no way to come back to me. Don't ask me for extra credit or to ask me to take the test. Later, if you miss it, it's over. So make sure you take the test on Monday, the 9th of May, sometime between midnight and midnight. When you take the test, you're going to be in Lockdown Browser, so make sure you have a computer that you have tested Lockdown Browser on. There's a test, a practice test that exists for you to test it ahead of time. You should be able to do that. It will invoke your webcam, so make sure your webcam is working. You have to be in a brightly lit room. You have to have your ID with you. If you don't have your talent card, bring your driver's license. Make sure that you are in a brightly lit room where the camera can see your face or it will not let you start the test. And also make sure that you are going to have two hours of uninterrupted time. Honestly, it's probably not going to take you two hours. There are only 20 questions. There's also a acknowledge question at the beginning that gives you some bonus points. Um, but when you take the test, make sure that you have the two hours and just take your time with it. Don't rush through it. I know you want to get over, get it over and done with, but just make sure you actually read the questions and you don't you know, pick the wrong answer out of uh, instinct and then end up missing it because you didn't actually read it. So take your time, work your way through it, do the questions you know the answers to first, and then work your way back to the harder questions until you complete the test. Um, once you're done with the test, it will tell you your grade on the final, and at that point you can calculate your overall grade in the class. Um, we will submit the grades before the deadline, but they will not be immediately after you take the test. Since you guys are taking your test next Monday, um, we will. it'll be Wednesday before we submit your grades, so they won't show up in Owl Express until probably Wednesday or Thursday. Um, so that's it. Other than that, good luck. It's been a pleasure seeing you this semester, and I will see you in the future hopefully around campus. Make sure that you are um, study for your exam and don't forget to take your exam on Monday, the 9th of May. See you.